Okay, shalom everyone, and welcome to another Wednesday night Isaiah study. So we're looking at Isaiah chapter 37, verses 19 to 24. And uh, before we begin, a little advertising. I'm, I'm on Telegram. You can come to the Messianic chat room and um, chat with me. And also check out Rabbi Jeremiah's stuff. You know, his uh, language immersion classes and Hebrew, lab, Hebrew language labs are fantastic. You know, and so you want to check those out. And you can talk to him too on, on Telegram. And so uh, let's go here to the next slide. Okay, so we're looking at chapter 37, verses 19 to 24. And I titled it, Discovering the Ultimate Superiority, the God of Israel versus the Rest. Okay, so uh, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Okay. Avinu Sheba Shamaim, Salach Lanu Al Chataenu, Azor Lanu, Lachayot et Chayenu Avurecha, Um Toda Al Ko Rachamecha, Beshem Yeshua Anu Mit Palalim. Heavenly Father, Forgive us of our sins. Help us to live our lives for you. And thank you, Lord, for all of your mercies. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, in in today's you know few verses here, uh, we read, I feel we read something that is, is so significant about the about who God, the God of Israel is. And when we look at the Bible, the Bible explains to us how. God is the creator. He is like no other, and he is a God of life and not of death. The Lord God delivers, he sustains, he makes new, and he loves his creation. And it is because of these attributes that Hezekiah, here in, in chapter 37, can refute these claims of the Assyrians and believe that God can deliver Jerusalem and Judah from Assyria. You know, the Lord God Almighty is on a, a, a completely different level from all of the other gods. You know, because all of the other gods, they're, they're false gods. They're not real, right? And so much so, our God is so great that he commands us not to be likened to any graven image of anything on earth or under the earth, right? Or in the sea, right? And, and we read this in um, Al Yad Sefer Shemot, and that is according to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. And um, the reason God commands us not to make, you know, a graven image of him, not to make an image of anything here on earth or anywhere, right, is because of his utter otherworldliness. And this sets the God of Israel above all of the gods of the nations. And this is how Hezekiah could declare his own trust in God, the Lord God Almighty, in a very concise way. And so we too, and when we study God's word, we too can declare our faith and our trust in the Lord in a very concise manner, you know, according to the scriptures, due to our having the word of God, the Bible, right? And the Lord God then tells Isaiah to speak to Hezekiah and how the Lord is going to deliver them in a powerful way in the opening verses of Isaiah chapter 37 and the events that then lead lead up to Hezekiah going up to the temple of the Lord are meant to lead humanity to repentance and trusting by faith. You know, we, we look at what Hezekiah did when he received these uh, Sepharim, these letters, when you see these letters from these men who had spoke with Rav Shaka in, in the Assyrian army, right, that he he looked at them, he read them, and then he took them up to the temple of the Lord. He spread them about before the Lord. He says, oh, Lord, help us, right? And this, this is how we are to behave. You know, we are to seek the God of Israel. We are to look to him, look to his Mashiach, Yeshua, right, and for, for salvation and for hope. And so, Hezekiah here, he leads his own people in from in Jerusalem, and he goes up unto the Temple Mount, and he spreads these documents out before the Lord. And when uh, when we repent and trust in the Lord with the proper kavana, you know that means the proper intention. It is then that the Lord will respond to us when we inquire of Him, right according to His Word. We note Yeshua; He taught some things about these about this you know about this matter in the new testament text so um th 
this reminded me of Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 25. And, and we see here in Mark 22 to 25, it says the following. It says, and, uh, and Yeshua answered them, Have faith in God, and truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, okay, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses, okay? And then um, the next set of verses here is from Luke 11 that I was reminded of in verses 9 through 13. And it says the following, it says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. And what the father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give of giving a fish, give him a serpent. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to good, good gifts, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Okay, so here in Mark 11, verse 22 to 25, Yeshua says, he says, exite pistein, or pistein theo, meaning that have faith in God in Greek, right? And this resonates with what we see taking place in the Isaiah text here in chapter 37, that we are to trust in the Lord, Right? We are to have faith in God. Just, just like Yeshua is saying right here. He says, have faith in God. Okay, and that, that's this um exite peace team theo here in, in Greek. You know, and here Yeshua speaks of trusting in the power of God, you know, and having faith that believing even a mountain can be moved and cast into the sea. And so uh, you know, it's interesting that. Yeshua uses this analogy of the sea, and uh, this is a this is a very rabbinic concept, and this idea of casting something into the sea is as is as utterly destroying something, such as idolatry. And we find this in the rabbinic literature that uh, we see something very similar going on in relation to idolatry, casting into the sea. And I think that this is an important this is a really important concept here when uh, considering our going before the Lord God, requesting pre freedom from sin while holding on to something in our lives that may be an idol of some sort, right? And there are many references in the rabbinic literature, and um, I thought I would look at a couple just to, just to illustrate this, how the rabbis also use this similar analogy. In the Talmud Bavli in Avodah Zara 43b, it, it says the Mishnah, Rabbi Yossi says, when one encounters an idol, he should grind the idol and throw the dust into the wind or cast it into the sea. Okay, and in, in, in Pesachim 28a, it says, or perhaps one may crumble it and throw it into the wind, right? But he may cast it into his, the sea in its pure, unadulterated form without crumbling at first. We also learned in a Mishnah, which with regard to idolatry in a case like this, that Rabbi Yossi says, he may grind the idol and, and throw the dust into the wind or cast it into the sea. So you see this, this reference back to uh, Avodah Zara, you know, tractate of Avodah Zara in the Talmud. And uh, the, the point of illustrating these, these things from the Talmud is simply that Yeshua was a rabbi in Judaism, right? And he used this mountain and this casting into the sea analogy to indicate the power of God and the power of our faith in trusting in God, right? And we note um, Yeshua says uh, that, he says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask, right? And it's right here in Luke 11, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whatever you, whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Okay. And so this is really important because here Yeshua suggests that prayer and forgiveness are tightly coupled together, meaning that we are not to hold anything against a brother or sister in the Lord when going before God and seeking his help. 
and for the forgiveness of sins even, right? And in just like what Isaiah is teaching us about sanctifying the name, the sanctity of the name of God in Isaiah 37. You know, Yeshua is saying that God will indeed take action for the sake of his name's sake, right? For the sake of his name, when we seek him in prayer, believing and trusting in living our lives for him. You know, and all of these things are, are absolutely important. And in Luke 11 here, verses 9 to 13, Yeshua speaks to the goodness of God as our Father who desires to give his children who seek and ask him, right? And um, who ask and seek him, right? And the point is that we can trust in the Lord because he hears us and is willing to answer our prayers. I mean, this is what I feel that Luke 11, verses 9 to 13 is, is trying to, to say to us. And we also note what David wrote in Psalm 66, 18, that if we regard iniquity, he said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not, the Lord will not hear me, right? That's what David said. And so the idea is that if we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. And this is why teshuvah is so important, repentance, right? It is so important before receiving answered prayer. You know, the point is, is that scripture revealed to, reveals to us how we are to seek God in repentance, that we are to trust in him, and then we are to live our lives for him, right? And uh, when we respond in these ways, we can be confident that he hears our prayers and that he will respond in a way that satisfies, right? And there are times when uh, this this made me, you know, when we think about this, we think about how God answers our prayer and or if we feel he doesn't answer our prayers, right? And there are times that there may be illness of some sort that we seek the Lord for healing. And I've, I've read many who question the idea that in Yeshua we are healed because when they ask in Yeshua's name, they don't receive healing. And I feel that the point of this specific matter is concerning our being in a battle in this life, you know, battle for righteousness and against unrighteousness, right? The message that we receive from the scriptures is that we are called to be God's people and we are called to maintain our faith and faithfulness regardless of what happens to us, whether we feel that God has answered our prayers or not, whether we feel that he has heard us or not, right? We, we seek him in the name of Yeshua, right? In the name of his Messiah, right? And um, believing that he has heard us, repent and turn from our sins and seek to live our lives for him, right? To bring glory to his name for his name's sake, right? And so when we do these things, we can be confident that he has heard us and, and then we can we continue living our lives for him regardless of what happens. You know, from Paul's comments in the New Testament text, the Lord sometimes does not heal. Remember, Paul had an issue with his eyes, right? And the uh, Lord said that in his weakness, he is strong, right? And so this is this is the same context even for us today, you know, and um, that the Lord sometimes does not heal. And this is for maintaining our faith and to consider regardless of what happens, we maintain the faith and this brings glory to his holy name. You know, our main objective in this life is to draw near to the Lord, to hold true to what is taught in his word, to stand upon his word, right, and in truth in our lives and to live for him, to tell others about the great mercy that he has had on us in Yeshua, and to bring glory to the name of Hashem, of the Lord God Almighty, right? The yod vav right? The name of God. And uh, so um, that is what I had for the introduction for the um, study for uh, tonight.